Assalamu alaikum everyone. I hope you all are fine. Here we are, with the fourth episode of our topic, the Mamluk Sultanate. But before moving forward, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and don't leave unless you like, share, and comment. So let's start with Language and Ethnic Identity under the Mamluks Arabic had a dominant presence in the religious, cultural, and bureaucratic spheres in Egypt even before the Mamluks came to power. Its widespread use among both Muslim and non-Muslim communities was driven by the desire to align with the ruling elite. This expansion was further facilitated by the Mamluks' victories and the consequent influx of Arabic-speaking immigrants from other conquered Muslim lands. Meanwhile, the Mamluk Kipchak language served as the spoken language among the ruling Mamluk elite, highlighting their distinct Turkic identity. Ethnicity played a crucial role in shaping the social hierarchy, with the predominantly Turkic or Turkicized Mamluk elite maintaining a noticeable separation from the Arabic-speaking populace. This distinction was evident in various aspects, such as names, attire, and access to administrative roles. While the Mamluk sons were typically excluded from the military elite, pride in their Kipchak Turkish or Circassian origins persisted among the Mamluk rulers, leading to the marginalization of those perceived as having non-Turkic lineage. Religious Diversity in Early Mamluk Egypt The early Mamluk era in Egypt witnessed a diverse religious landscape, including Sunni Islam with its major mudubs, various Sufi orders, small Ismaili Shia communities in Upper Egypt and a significant minority of Coptic Christians. Sultan Saladin Zayabids initiated efforts to strengthen Sunni Islam to counteract Christianity and Ismailism, which had thrived under the Fatimids. Under the Bari Sultans, Sunni Islam promotion intensified, motivated by personal piety and political expediency. This served as a unifying factor between the Mamluks and their predominantly Sunni subjects, creating moral unity in response to the challenges posed by the Crusader and Mongol invasions. Management of Religious Diversity The Mamluks strategically cultivated Muslim leaders to guide the religious sentiments of their subjects without undermining the Sultanate's authority. Similar to their Ayyubid predecessors, the Bari Sultans favored the Shafi'i Mudub but also promoted the Maliki, Hanbali, and Hanafi Mudubs. Baibars introduced a shift in the tradition of selecting a Shafi'i scholar as Qadi al Quda, appointing judges from each mudub, potentially accommodating the diverse Muslim population. Patronage of Sufi Orders The Mamluks embraced various Sufi orders, notably the Shad Hilaya, the most popular during the 13th century. Sufism, widespread in Egypt, incorporated Sunni Islamic piety, mysticism, and elements of popular religion. While Sunni ulama received patronage through government appointments, the Mamluks funded Sufis by supporting Zawayas. On the contrasting end, the teachings of Hanbali scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, emphasizing moral rigor and opposing Sufi practices, faced opposition. Despite being influential, Ibn Taymiyyah's doctrines were considered heretical by the Sunni establishment supported by the Mamluks. Bedouin tribes in the Mamluk military Bedouin tribes served as a reserve force in the Mamluk military, particularly strengthened under an Nasir Muhammad. These tribes, such as Al Fadl from Syria, not only contributed to the military but also played a vital role in the Mamluk economy by supplying Arabian horses. An Nasir Muhammad's third reign saw the Al Fadl tribe receiving significant dictate, preventing their potential defection to the Ilkhanate. Challenges and conflicts with Bedouin tribes. While Baibars, Kala'an, and earlier viceroys were cautious about granting high-quality iktate to Bedouin sheikhs, and Nasir Muhammad's policies changed during his third reign. The Al Fadl tribe gained substantial iktate, becoming a dominant force among the Bedouins. This shift, driven by an Nasir Muhammad's strategy to prevent defection, resulted in competition, conflict, and rebellion among Bedouin tribes in Syria, leading to significant bloodshed. Mamluks and Bedouin Relations in Egypt In Egypt, Mamluks, especially during an Nasir Muhammad's third reign, mirrored their relationship with Bedouin tribes. The Isa ibn Hassan al Hajjan tribe gained power with massive iktate but faced frequent rebellions against succeeding Bari sultans. Bedouin tribal wars disrupted trade and travel in Upper Egypt, 
leading to the Iraq and Banu Hilal tribes becoming de facto rulers. By 1353, Amir Sheikh's campaigns purged Bedouin influence from Upper and Lower Egypt. Mamluk Governance and Territorial Control The Mamluks maintained the administrative, legal, and economic systems inherited from the Ayyubid state, preserving the territorial domain encompassing Egypt, the Levant, and the Hejaz. Unlike the Ayyubid's divided sovereignty, the Mamluks established a unitary state with Cairo as the capital, governed by a sultan. Provincial power was delegated to deputy sultans, and Mamluk emirs assumed leadership in most regions. Sultan succession and rule. Sultan accession involved an informal process, including emirs and Mamluks electing a sultan, who would then lead a Cairo procession and have his name read in the Friday prayer sermon. Although dynastic succession occurred, especially in the Bari regime, competition among factions often led to usurpations. The practical limitations on a sultan's power arose from his kushdashiyah and constant tensions with other emirs. The sultan's authority was crucial for maintaining factional unity. Power dynamics and constraints. Mamluk emirs considered the sultan a peer and benefactor who ensured their benefits, leading to riots or coup plots when expectations were unmet. The sultan's authority derived from kushdashiyah, factional loyalty, and negotiations with other emirs creating a delicate balance of power. Factional unity within the royal Mamluks, particularly those with Kushdashiya bonds, often determine loyalty. However, even sultan loyal factions rebelled at times, challenging the sultan's authority. Sultan's roles and responsibilities. As the head of state, the sultan held powers such as issuing legal orders, making war decisions, levying taxes, overseeing food distribution and managing the investigation and punishment of criminals. Sultans led annual Hajj pilgrimages, providing the Kaaba covering and supporting Jerusalem's Dome of the Rock. The importation of Mamluks into the Sultanate was a priority, but external disruptions, like conflicts with Mongols, Armenians, and Crusaders, impacted this process. In times of need, Ilkhanid deserters, or prisoners of war were enlisted as soldiers. Mamluk Rule and Legitimization To legitimize their rule, the Mamluks portrayed themselves as Islam's defenders and sought confirmation from a caliph, a role once fulfilled by the Abbasid Caliphate. After the Mongols' destruction of Baghdad in 1258, Baibars reinstated the caliphate, aligning with Caliph al-Mustansir. The caliph acknowledged the sultan's authority over vast territories, although later Abbasid caliphs held little power within the Mamluk government. Military Structure and Reforms Mamluk Sultans, emerging from the military hierarchy, reserved entry for Mamluks, while their sons could rise through military ranks or pursue civilian careers. Baibars transformed the army, forming the Royal Mamluk Regiment, Amir-led troops, and the Halka. Amirs, forming private armies, led to disruptions. The Halka, under the Sultan's command, declined by the 14th century. Military Hierarchy and Reforms Baibars reformed the Ayyubid army's improvised structure, introducing a hierarchical system, assigning emirs ranks, and standardizing ICTA distribution. Kala'un continued these reforms, maintaining lists of emirs and defining their roles in mobilization. Mamluk innovations in administration led to new offices like Ustadar, Hajib, and Amir Jandar. The Ustadar al-Aliyah, Chief of Staff, gained significance, becoming a key financial official in the late 14th century under Barkuk and Nasir Faraj. Mamluk Economy, State and Free Market The Mamluk economy comprised the state-controlled elite sphere and the free market for the general society. The Mamluks centralized the economy through bureaucracy, military hierarchy, and the ICTA system, with the Nile River contributing to this centralization. The monetary system, inherited from the Ayyubids, faced instability due to frequent changes by different sultans, leading to inflation. Market Supervision, the Hispa System The Mamluks established the Hispa administrative body to oversee the market, with Matasibs ensuring fair trade practices. The Matasibs, positioned in Cairo, Alexandria, Al-Fustat, and Lower Egypt, played a crucial role in maintaining quality standards, inspecting weights, 
preventing price gouging and overseeing legal trade. In the 15th century, Mamluk emirs took on the role of Matasab during cash shortages or a shift from a legal to an enforcement role. ICTA system, economic foundation. Inherited from the Ayyubids, the ICTA system was pivotal in the Mamluk power structure, representing a right to collect revenue from a designated territory. The Mamluks curtailed the tendency to treat ICTA as personal property, ensuring it remained an emir's source of income. Amirs leased or sold ICTA rights to non-Mamluks, providing more revenue stability than other methods like tax hikes. The ICTA system, assessed through periodic surveys, expanded over time to meet fiscal needs, leading to neglect of administrative responsibilities by ICTA holders and reduced productivity. Agriculture and Economic Control Agriculture was the backbone of the Mamluk economy, providing revenue through exports from Egypt, Syria, and Palestine. Industries like sugar and textiles, relying on agricultural products such as sugarcane and cotton, were closely tied to this sector. The state taxed every agricultural commodity, with the Sultan's treasury taking the largest share. Emirs derived their main income from ICTA lands, funding their private corps with agricultural revenues. Centralization and Regional Differences Mamluk control over agricultural production was more pronounced in Egypt due to the Nile's singular role in irrigation. Centralization faced complexities in Syria and Palestine because of diverse geography and frequent invasions. While not as high as in Egypt, the Mamluks controlled the Syrian economy, deriving revenues contributing to the realm's defense. Governors' Responsibilities and Bedouin Raids Mamluk governors aimed to foster agricultural production by repopulating areas, protecting lands from Bedouin raids, and enhancing productivity in barren lands. Preventing Bedouin armament was crucial to ensuring uninterrupted rural life, avoiding disruptions to agricultural work, and safeguarding revenues. International Trade and Economic Strategies Egypt and Syria played vital roles in medieval international trade. Mamluks expanded their foreign trade, signing treaties with Genoa and Ceylon. In the 15th century, internal upheaval, plagues, and Bedouin encroachment led to a financial crisis. To recover, the Mamluks taxed urban classes, increased cotton and sugar production for Europe, and focused on transit trade. European Mamluk trade, especially in spices, became a significant revenue source, despite challenges from the Black Plague and Papal restrictions. State Monopoly and Decline Under Sultan Bars Bay, a state monopoly on luxury goods, particularly spices, was established. The state controlled prices and collected profits. Bars Bay's directives regarding trade routes aimed to boost revenue. However, the Portuguese Empire's expansion in the late 15th and early 16th centuries disrupted the Mamluk Venetian monopoly, contributing to the decline and fall of the Sultanate. Mamluk Decorative Arts Mamluk decorative arts, including glass, metalwork, woodwork, and textiles, held prestige in the Mediterranean and Europe. Mamluk glassware influenced the Venetian glass industry. Trade links with Iran, India, and China turned Mamluk cities into trade and consumption hubs. Chinese motifs influenced local art. The Mamluks, rising from slavery, were discerning patrons commissioning luxury objects, notably in architecture. Al Nasir Muhammad and Kate Bay's reigns marked high points in the arts. Evolution of patronage in art forms. Artistic patronage varied over time, with architecture being the primary focus. Enamel glassware thrived initially but declined by the 15th century. Carpets mostly date from the end of the Mamluk period. Curran manuscripts were elaborately illuminated, featuring gilded foliate scroll work and geometric motifs. Metalware, especially brass items, was widely used but declined in quality in later periods. Glass lamps, produced in Damascus, were a highlight, especially those commissioned for mosques. Mamluk Architecture Mamluk architecture featured multifunctional buildings with creative floor plans, mainly in Cairo but also in Damascus, Jerusalem, Aleppo, and Medina. Patrons built mausoleums with attached charitable structures. 
the cruciform floor plan gained prominence in madrasas, adorned with elaborate decorations like stone carving and marble paneling. Entrance portals and minarets became more ornate, displaying influences from Syria, Ilkhanid Iran, and Venice. Domes transitioned from wooden to stone structures, reaching their peak under Kate Bay in the late 15th century. Ottoman Influence and Neo-Mamluk Style After the Ottoman conquest in 1517, new Ottoman-style buildings emerged, but the Mamluk style persisted and even combined with Ottoman elements. Late Mamluk building types, like sable kotabs and multi-storied caravansarais, increased during the Ottoman era. In the late 19th century, a neo-Mamluk style emerged as a nationalist response, promoting local Egyptian styles against Ottoman and European influences. So, that's all for today. See you in the next episode. Allah Hafiz.